All right, I'm gonna talk about chairs today. Um, and we'll get through kind of the motif and the metaphor as we walk through. But the idea and the goal for tonight is so that every time you see a chair, you think about team dynamics. You think about startups. And I want to challenge your perception so that every single time you see it, you think of the four core principles that I will share with you. And I imagine, I hope, most of you will actually see a chair very, very differently. First, I want to give a very brief introduction. I don't want to spend too much time on myself because that stuff's relatively boring. But I'm going to go whip through these things fairly quickly. The past, um, I was a graduate of Georgia Tech. Uh, I went to the dean for that, uh, even as an alumni, which is re really weird, because uh, you, can't, you can't do that, because that, that is that's violent. <laughs> um, then I got two graduate degrees from, from Dallas Seminary, uh, one in education. So education is a really deep passion of mine. I worked as a senior engineer, um, an architect, and eventually an executive for some of these companies, so the top four mostly. And then I worked in, as a contract person for these other companies. Very boring, boring shit. <laughs> I spend most of my time now in four core areas, not equally distributed, and it, it fluctuates here and there. But the biggest one is my most important startup, is my family. This is my favorite picture of all time. Uh, I don't wear and own a suit or, t or a tie, really. So I'm dressed down. My wife is just gorgeous. She's a UGA grad. Yeah. Uh, you have to go to UGA for the hot chicks. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's so offensive. Uh, my youngest is insane. And my oldest wants to be princess, so she's in her own world. This really captures uh, home life for me. Um, one of the benefits of kind of doing your own thing is you have incredible freedom to invest in the, in the things that really, really matter. Secondly, I spend time now coaching um, other entrepreneurs, uh, angel investing, and doing cohorts and accelerators. And I love that. I love spending time educating other entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs, uh, hopefully that, so that they can make, uh, not make the mistakes that I've made, I've made countless, and uh, so that they can achieve greater success. I do have one current startup here in Atlanta, these th uh, three partners of mine. Uh, we all kind of grew up uh, in the 80s, so we're all kind of 8-bit retro gamers, and so I named a company 8-bit, go figure. What's fascinating is we've been around for so long that if you Google 8-bit, my company is at the top. We beat 8-bit.com, which is very odd. Um, we build software for the web. And lastly, I spend an incredible amount of time alone. I think as an entrepreneur, if you don't have time where you're just resting, and when I mean resting, I mean literally doing nothing, then you're doing yourself an incredible disservice. Because as a creative person, you, you have to re-energize yourself. And at times, I'll stand up in front of a board and I'll just kind of wireframe something out um, or create something in my head, maybe not even practical for my companies, but it's an important cycle. It's a life cycle, continual weekly cycle that you must allocate time for. All right, so let's talk about an incredibly good chair. Um, first of all, I think I'm going to need, can you give me that chair for a second? That's something in my eye. All right, so to begin, to challenge your perspective of kind of team dynamics and the importance of teams within the context of a startup, uh, I want to I embed in your mind this. So every time you sit on one, you think of my four core principles. Not that they're amazing. I think they're amazing, but they're, they might be mediocre. And I want to challenge you to see how perception and the four unique roles that you guys have been walking through this summer can change the core identity of a chair. This is all so metaphysical, but just watch. So what is this? This is where audience participation. It's a chair. OK. So. Uh, let's see, what if I put my glass of water on it? It's a, it's a table. Okay, yeah. So what happens if I, if I stand on it? I hope I don't die. 
It's a stool, right? So what if I, what if I prop it up against the door? Doorstop. It's a doorstop. And what if I pick it up and then throw it at this gentleman here? It's a weapon. Or it transcends physicality. It's an act of violence. Or perhaps an act of revolution. Right? So, but it's still a chair, right? And so that's the idea with a startup. You have a core role, but in, without the other three perspectives, without the other three responsibilities, you don't have a company, you don't have a team, you don't have a great business. Great products are built by great teams, great teams create great companies. So without a good chair, you will not be successful. So I want to walk through four kind of, I don't know if they're life lessons, four core ideas as it relates to teams and you as an individual that apply to all of the four H's, which I can't remember because I have ADHD. Hacker, hustler, hipster. Hip, hip, what is hipster? Is that, oh yeah, skinny jeans, tight, loss of blood circulation. Uh, what was the other one? Hack. Hack, okay, hacker, yeah, storyteller, cool. You know, you know what's so interesting of the last decade is seeing that that is an official title in the enterprise. That's, that's some wild shit. Um, anyway, all right. So startup, I can't even remember what I meant. SR, startup rule number one, be effing badass, all right? One of the neat things about your summer course or this summer program is it's really helping you to understand how important it is to be a specialist. No one hires mediocre people. Unfortunately, the educational system of America creates mediocre people. Just think about that. You're required to take courses that you suck at, that you hate, and that you couldn't give less of a fuck about. They're forcing you to be mediocre people. The world of technology especially doesn't hire those people. Those people go and work at McDonald's. We hire T people, which I know you guys reference a couple times. People with a broad scope of understanding, but deep specialization. Be insanely focused. You may feel like, oh, you know, as, as you walk through summer, oh, I'm kind of a storyteller, I'm a hacker, and I can do some business because I can talk with, you know, with someone about our product. That is a no-no. If you have a great team, then you can move those responsibilities to that person who does it better than you. Be a specialist. Be amazing. Oh, and as you guys grow and scale, hire specialists. You don't need any mediocre play people on your team. And especially if you move to venture capital. I've raised 13 million now in angel and venture. They don't care about mediocre players. Only A players at the table. Number two, build on trust. It's the true currency of great relationships. We all know that. But how well do you trust the people that are sitting right beside you to do the great work in a very limited amount of time with a lot of money in the bank? The, the moment you first, you, you first raise venture capital and you open up your bank statement, you know, you gotta, I, I, I'm with USAA, you might be with Bank of America, or Wachovia, you used to be on Techwood, but I guess they're not there anymore. Wells Fargo. So the first time you open that bank statement and you see six zeros plus whatever, it's like mind blowing. And then you get this really deep pit in your stomach and it's a vomit reflex. <laughs> you have to trust seriously the people that you're working with. And when people say, and you've read a thousand times, startup is very much like a marriage, that is no joke. You eat, you sleep, you breathe with those people. And if you don't trust them, there's very little chance you're going to be able to work through the very difficult decisions. Uh, sidebar, one of the most difficult questions that I had to field when I was pitching for venture capital was, as I sat there with my co-founders, one of the, the VCs asked me straight to my face and said, if I give you half a million dollars, which is your, your Series A, I guess it's Angel now, but Series A, but we fire your partner. What do you think about that? And I was like, ugh, oh, you know, that pit in your stomach. And then he looked at my partner and said, if I give you a half a million dollars, because I think you could do it, 
but you, John has to leave the company for that check, what do you think about that? Those are very difficult decisions, but real decisions. It's do I trust the people on my team well enough to say, I don't need your money because without him or her, this company would not survive. I don't, I don't need your money for that. But it's an incredibly difficult question. So you need to cycle, you need to trust the people you work with, which is why I believe that you should work with friends. You will read tons of commentary that contradicts this statement. But I have seen some incredible work through my, my, my greatest friends, and I just don't trust anyone else. With all of that money, with all of my limited time, with the mortgage and the, that my daughters who have to go to school, I want to cut out the bullshit as quickly as possible. Just think of when you meet someone new. All of the relational jockeying that goes on, right? Oh man, the guy's wearing glasses, yeah. or the guy's wearing dockers, or the guy doesn't even wear shoes, or he likes his coffee black, or he likes it with cream and sugar, that's gay. Like, you know, it's like all of that, all of that is bullshit, but it takes months for you to weed all of that out until you get comfortable enough to ask the real questions. Like, hey man, that piece of code is shit, and we need to, we need to sprint today to get it done. If you're still worrying about, oh man, will he get offended if we have chicken instead of pork for tonight? It's like, that's crazy. You don't have time for that. So I choose to work with friends because at that point, it's just like, I'm going to look you straight in the face and be like, dude, we're totally cool and we're drinking beers tonight, but that was shit. So we're, we're staying 10 hours later today and it's, it'll be all good. And your wife will forgive me. Like, that's legit. Cut out the bullshit, accelerate what matters. You don't have to spend any time with, oh, I gotta get black coffee too. You know, it's just like work with friends. Lastly, team first. You have to throw away the ego. You just suck without a team. I don't care if you're like a, a genius or you know you believe in this concept called the solopreneur. I don't buy that for a second. Think of any company any product that you have installed in your device, mobile device right now, any luminary in our industry, especially in tech, and they had a team. Steve had Waz, right? You know, Hewlett and Packard. Just, it goes all the way back to the grandfathers of computing. Everyone does great stuff with teams. So if you think you're better than that, you need to just check that at the door. You need a team and you need specialists. So, every time you see a chair, I want you to think of those four things. I want you to think of, I need to be a specialist, I need to be top of my game in one of the things, those four H, H's. I need to partner with people. I need to trust those people with my life. And I need to put away the ego, because there's just no time for that. Does this really work? And I just answer that, yes, we all know that. Great products are built by great teams. Great companies are great by good teams. All the luminaries. But from my experience, my first startup, uh, my first like true startup, I started created a dating website for World of Warcraft players. <laughs> and uh, I know it's a joke, but it's legit. So, um, and in fact, it really I was really sad about a couple months ago they officially closed it down. Um, it was called datecraft.com, uh, so it's, it's not there anymore. But uh, I bootstrapped that by myself, did everything by myself, and uh, that was back in 2007. It got on the Gawker Network, Otaku, and all that stuff, so it was like a big deal, Business Insider. And then it was acquired. And I was like, man, that was awesome. Like, I think I should really continue doing this. So the next startup, about nine months later, I created the first Twitter for evangelical Christians. It's called Gospeler, and that got on TechCrunch. Engineered the entire product, built the, the business um, by myself. Uh, back then, 2009, Twitter didn't have lists. So this enabled me to have select conversations with people that I wanted to have without having to be in the home stream of Twitter. Now, of course, they have lists, so that's really easy. So I created this using their crappy API and, uh, and created that company. It was acquired, awesome. 
But every single time, the only person I was celebrating was, with was myself. And the products weren't nearly as good. Uh, I didn't negotiate nearly well enough. Didn't d do enough marketing. I mean, anyone who's been on TechCrunch is like this, and then it's like this, you know, like in terms of traffic and interest. Uh, but I'll tell you, these, these four things are true. Now that I've created companies with, peop with people, with teams, with partners, I've, had ma I've made more money. I've had more margin, which is very important. I'll come back to that. I've had more success, and success is very subjective. You can, you can, you know, you can dissect that a thousand different ways. But just generally, I've had more success, and I've had more fun with teams. And so if you can engender that, even though you might be young, kind of into your in a startup mode and first time entrepreneur, if you can trust me on these things, you'll be much farther than I am. And I'm still young, I'm 30, you know? But this is the, this is the kicker margin, because your life is not your startup. And they feel like that, but life is so much bigger than your technology company. Like, trust me, I love my wife, I love my kids, I love traveling. And a team allows you to have margin, where you can, I was in Florida last week, I'll be in DC next week, just vacation stuff. My teams are taking care of everything. That's, that's so important. Um, and I think you'll be, be better off. That's it. That's all I've got for you. How was I on time? You did well, right, right, on, right on the nose. Nice, so. that's badass. All right, hey, what's your question? Hey, um, so how do you focus on your individual role when everyone kind of wants to be the business lead? I'm sorry, say again? How do you focus on your individual role, like if you're a hacker or a coder or a developer, and everyone kind of wants to be the business lead and be at the table and having a conversation with the VCs? Like, I don't know, that's, um, I'm trying hard to understand that because if you're, if you're an incredible hacker, if you're an incredible engineer, you don't want to, you don't want to talk to anyone. Like, right? Because you're in love with your LCD. You know, so you might just be head faking yourself and be like, I'm an engineer. No, you're not. Go do something else. Go be the guy that, that makes the deals. You know, um, for the longest time, I, I was kind of like um, the last speaker. You know, I went to tech. I kind of failed my way through tech. I mean, I, I literally did. I dropped out. Uh, uh, but I was an engineer. I, I worked as an engineer, and I thought, I, I thought, thought I'm pretty badass. But I, I really wasn't, because I wanted a seat at the table. I'm far better at negotiating technology deals, raising money, than I am building. But it took me a long time for that to admit that, because let's, let's be honest, there is a, there's a mystique, kind of something very uh, Hollywood-esque about saying, yeah, man, I'm an architect. What the fuck does that mean? Like, and who cares? At the end of the day, who cares? So when, when I counsel and mentor young entrepreneurs, I said, drop the ego. The title means nothing. Do what you are best at and, in, and own it. And guess what? When you do, you become what we call an attractive resource. When I hire and I scale my companies, I look for people who are so in love with that one, maybe two things, that that's all I want them to do. Here, here's $100,000. Do exactly what you want to do, because I know my company is going to be better. I don't want you wishy-washy over here, and you never wanted to sit at the table here. I'm not going to ask you to be in this meeting, right? So. Again, I, I'm speaking, and I, I feel really ashamed because it took me so long, you know, to learn that. But if you guys can drop the ego and be like, "Dude, I was made to be a storyteller. There ain't no shame in that," because the only way people know about our company is because of what I'm talking about. You know, that's a big deal. So, own what you're good at. Does that make sense? Last question. Here we go. All right, Laura. I apologize for my language. When I get riled up, man, I get riled up. <laughs> you can't. My, it's what you like. You know, you're recording this and stuff. My daughter's gonna see this one day. Uh, <laughs> good. I'm sorry.
Yeah, and, that, and that's simply because you haven't been sh you haven't been sharing it enough. Like when I I learned this from one of my mentors. I said, if your idea, if you believe in your idea so much, at least even the concept, the blue sky idea, then you have no choice but to share it with every single person. And he said, which, which means practically, wherever you go, talk about it. It doesn't have to be A to Z complete. You don't have to have a business model. You don't even need to know what framework or coding language you're going to write. Just tell them, what do you think? If you're standing in Starbucks, here's a great activity for you. And for those who are in the business kind of development space, this is an incredible lesson for you. When you were literally standing in Starbucks for that grande latte, which is gross, I drink my coffee black, I want you to identify five people, five people that you think might give a fuck. And you go up to them while you're waiting and say, dude, I know this is crazy. I'm a white guy, or I'm an Asian guy, and, you know, and I speak really good English. But can I just share with you like a really crazy idea? Like, a dating website for World of Warcraft players. What? You know? And just see what the response is. And what happens, because you're, you're telling your story over and over and over again, is you begin to pick up on the nuances of reaction, of social behavior. When someone steps back away from you, you know, even, even when they're not even thinking, they heard the idea, but they're like, you know, they don't like it. So you refine, you refine. You say, ah, oh, I told it wrong. I told it wrong. It's a great idea. I told it wrong. The next person, they'd be like, man, that's awesome. And who knows, that could be your next engineer. Like, you just never know. So, so your idea is not a bad one. Your question is not a bad one. It's practice all the time. You haven't found the person, you're not telling enough people. Be, just be that crazy girl on Facebook that's like, I know this is the 100,000 update today, but dude, my startup is the jam, you know? Um, and, it, and again, you're going to become a very attractive resource. People are like, man, I need her on my team, or I can get behind someone like that who is sold out for their company, right? So I don't know if that answers, but whatever. <laughs>